India has 15.5 percent of the world's population and its income is 1.5 percent of the world income. 15.5 percent population, 1.5 percent of the world's income. And our unemployed people, if you look at the register, which is maintained by the 664 employment exchanges throughout India, there are about 24 million already registered in the 664 employment exchanges. 24 million. Now the total number employed in the organized sector, that is public and private sector taken together, is about the same, 24 million. In other words, there are as many people on the employment exchanges registered seeking employment, as many as are already employed in the entire organized sector. The real number of the unemployed would be around 45 million, because many of them don't get registered on the employment exchanges. Now, it is this situation which has been facing finance minister year after year, but the finance minister has been pleased to open his box and bring out proposals as antiquated as the box in which they are contained. How can you deal with these problems with your outdated hundred-year-old economic thinking? That is where the relevance of the present budget lies. Now how do you deal with a budget's quality and value? To my mind, you acquire you apply four criteria. First, honesty and rationality. Secondly, economic efficiency. Thirdly, simplicity. And fourthly, equity or social justice. By all the four criteria, this budget gets excellent marks. Let's take one after another. First, honesty and rationality. This is the only rational budget I have read in the last 30 years, as I said, presented in this country. If you read the budget speech, if you read the memo explanatory memorandum, if you read the finance bill, by the way, the notes on clauses are very badly drafted, but they are not drafted by the finance minister. Somebody deserves to be pulled up for drafting the notes on the clauses so badly. But taking it by and large, as I said, it gives you an indication that a rational mind has been applied to the art problems. The irrational, arbitrary, whimsical, disillusioned phase have been removed. For example, for quite some years in this country, advertisement expenses motor car expenses, hotel expenses have been disallowed to the extent of 20 percent. Not that it had any basis in reason, in common sense, in law, in logic, no. Some section officer, some deputy secretary thought it up and this is the way they thought they would collect more revenue for the government. Well, that disallowance has been removed or take deposits taken by public companies. 15% is paid by most companies for three-year deposits. Well, 15%, one five, 15% of the interest paid on the deposits used to be disallowed to limited companies. Why? No reason except the whimsicality of somebody in Delhi. That has been removed. So, so much about the rationality of the budget. Lord Keynes used to say, men will do the rational thing, but only after he has explored all other alternatives. <laughs> India explored for 30 years all alternatives and has ultimately decided to do the rational thing. In the meanwhile, a whole generation has gone, many have died, a new one has come up in 30 years. But now, after 30 years, we begin to realize that taxation cannot depend on the whimsicality of one or five individuals. And honesty. 
as I read the budget speech and looked at the provision, I am struck by the honesty of purpose with which it has been introduced. None of the humor in the graveyard kind of thing as it happened in the past. I remember vividly a budget speech delivered by a person I will not name, but the, at that time the income tax rate maximum was 92 percent. And the budget speech says, with a view to leaving an incentive to the man who earns, 8 percent will remain with him. <laughs> and on the CCI loans, I called it an example of humor in a graveyard. You can't do that to a nation. You can keep your humor to yourself, and if you have no understanding of what human forces of self-interest are, for what reason human beings work, then you have no business to be in charge of the finances of a great country like this. Well, the honesty is there also in another respect. The budget deficit has been mentioned as 3,349 crores. People have thought it to be high. It is a high deficit, perhaps the highest ever estimated when a budget is presented. But that's the very honesty of the finance minister. If you had the type of practice which prevailed in the past, the budget would have been disclosed as 1,000 crores. Then by the time the end of the year comes, many people forget what was the original estimate. You know, there are in fact actually three figures of the budget. First, the original estimate when the budget is presented. Second, the estimate at the end of the year. And third, the actual figure which comes two years later. But by the time the final figure comes, nobody bothers to know what was the original estimate. Therefore, things pass muster. And even if you give a dishonest estimate earlier, nobody is going to remember it. Well, this minister strikes me as having given an honest estimate of what he regards as the possible deficit. I come to the second point, economic efficiency. This is the factor most forgotten in Indian budgeting for all the past years, the 30 years I have been referring to. Economic efficiency means how far is your budget going to enthuse the people, generate dynamism, promote growth, assist endeavor and, and, and uh, efforts of the people. How far will you motivate them to give their best to the country? This is the economic efficiency of a budget. I'll give you two examples, or just three examples in history as to what happens when the taxation rates are unduly high, oppressively high. First, Sweden. Sweden was governed by socialists for a number of years, and Dr. Gunnar Mjordal himself is a confirmed socialist of many, many years. But even he noticed that the rates of taxation were so high that a thoroughly honest nation was turned into a dishonest one. And he said it in so many words. He said, Swedish people are honest people, law-abiding people, but the levels of taxation have made them thoroughly dishonest. Let me give you a second example. The British. They are a law-abiding people. In fact, the standard of compliance with the taxation laws was the highest in Britain till a few years ago when the Labour Party came and levied taxation like our taxation at 97% maximum rate. People started becoming dishonest. There are the Jersey Islands, the Isle of Man, Guernsey, where you can, it's the underground where you can uh, shelter your wealth and shelter your income. Many, many people started doing that. In 1981, the Inland Revenue, which is the Income Tax Department of England, made a report where they said, we have examined the accounts of different companies. 85% of the companies had understated their profits. 85% in a country like England, unheard of. But they are referring, the report refers to the early years when the level of taxation was excessive, oppressive. 
Let me give you a third and final instance of this, so far as reports go. The World Bank had a report made to it, which is called a working paper, in the year 1983. They examined the economies of 20 countries, some of them low tax rate countries, some of them high tax rate countries. The working paper shows that in the countries where low tax rates prevailed, the rate of growth was 7.3%. In the other batch of countries where very high rates of tax prevailed, the rate of growth, economic growth was 1.1%. Just see the difference, 7.3 and 1.1. This is what taxation can do to a country. Either it can make it progress, prosper, grow, develop, or it can keep it, as India has been kept for 30 years, as the 15th poorest nation in the world. So when you look at the tax rates, don't think that these are only for the rich. They affect every man in India, because they will decide whether the poor men will ever see a better, a brighter tomorrow or not. It's not only for the rich, it affects everyone, I repeat that sentence. Because taxes ultimately percolate down to the lowest level of society. So what have the countries done? Let's look quickly at the historical precedents for what we have done in 85. In the early 50s, Germany, West Germany was occupied by the armed forces of the Allies, and the U.S. General was the Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Forces. He was the, the main person in charge of West Germany. I'm talking of the early 50s. There was rationing, heavy taxation, controls. One Sunday morning, Dr. Erhard, who somehow, under a mistake according to the General, was put in power, he decided that there will be no controls, no rationing, and the rates of tax will be drastically reduced. I've told the story before, but it will bear repetition. So when he announced that the rates of taxation would be drastically lowered, and the controls will all go, the general in charge of the armed allied forces called him and said, Dr. Erhard, do you realize you have made a monumental blunder. And Dr. Erhard said, General, don't worry, my advisors tell me exactly the same thing. It is one man who makes the difference. And I personally believe it is the present Prime Minister who has made the difference. So, the rates were lowered, controls were gone, and West Germany became one of the great economic powers of the world. His exact words were, Dr. Erhard, I shall let the men and money lose, and they will make the country great. And he was right. So never be misled by the pessimists who say, well, what will happen to this country if the rates are lowered or if the controls go? One gentleman from the press asking, but why have you placed 100 crores as the limit for registration under the MRTP Act? Some people ask only for 50 crores. You ought to read history a little more carefully. 